I was in college at UCLA, but I was also, I would take quarters off to work for Roger Corman. I get a phone call and it's Stan Winston. And he said, Jim Cameron recommended you to come work on this movie. I said, could I come in and show you my portfolio? Because, you know, it's Stan Winston. You know, I'm not going to pass up an opportunity. And he was like, ah, okay. So we, we you know, uh. My impression of Stan looking at my book is, uh, ah, okay. Oh, okay. One of those. And yeah, okay. Yeah. And, oh, look, a mold. Yeah, I've, I've seen a mold before. And he flipped through my um, portfolio like this. Uh-huh, 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 okay, thanks. And I thought, oh, God, I blew it. The first time he looked through mine, he's like whipping through. Ah, it's very good. Yeah, reminds me of when I first started out. The first day I started working, he'll come by and says, oh, you're new around here. And I'm like, yes, sir. And he's like, yeah, so you like it here? And I said, uh, what are you going to say, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, I love it. And Stan's like, good, but don't get used to it. And he'll walk away. <laughs> he, like, he likes to mess with you. I had done a little sculpture. I was very inspired by the sculpture Stan was doing with Jim Cagle. So I, I was carrying it very carefully, and I put it on the desk. And Stan's like, what the hell's that? I said, well, it was, it's a sculpture I did for you, but it, I had an accident on the bus stand. And I was like 14 years old or 15 years old. Uh, he's like, ah, hmm, huh. Well, this is nice here, and this is nice. So what am I supposed to do with it? I said, well, it's for you. And he went, oh. And he took it, and he put it in the garbage can. And he went, okay, now go home and do something better. I always felt like I was trying to imp impress him. The, the, the thing about, about Stan, you know, I've heard, you know, heard said that, that he was a perfectionist, and I know that there were times when, like, for example, I was sculpting the, uh, the alien tail, right, for aliens. And I think I probably laid it out, you know, blocked it out uh, three times before he was happy with it, you know? Happy with it to the point where I, then I said, I said, Matt Rose isn't doing anything right now. Can he do the alien tail? And I, I you know, I got off, yeah, off, the, off the alien tail and Matt did a great job. But the nice thing was that Stan let me sculpt the alien head. And I look at that head now, I said, where was Stan the perfectionist then? Because <laughs> I look at things on that that I think are really crappy. I had been on set before, but never as the department head. I think I was about uh, 25. And I can remember my hair falling out in clumps. And, and every morning I would be on the phone with Stan talking to him in London. One of the producers was saying, and yes, you can see it takes two hours to put a person into the suit, which was completely untrue. It take, took 20 minutes. And they're constantly breaking down. He's basically bad mouthing, building a, an insurance case so they could falsely claim money. But so I was giving this report to Stan, I said, yeah, and well, they're not saying the kind of, what do you mean? Well, they're being a little, um, you know, like they're being a little bit, um, um, uh, you, you mean they're taking the work for granted? Yeah, kind of, they're mistreating you guys? Yes, put that son of a bitch on the phone. What? Go find that guy, right? And so I'm like handing the phone to a producer and it was from my side of the conversation all I could hear was and the producer going, no, no, Stan, Stan, no, 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 what? Stan, now Stan, 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 <laughs> Stan, okay, Stan. And he hung up and after that, the guy was like in check. So they were being real ball busters on it, but all it took was for Stan to rattle the chain and, and he got results. On Aliens, it was the Alien Queen was two stunt performers laying almost back to back with their upper shoulders slightly V'd apart with their inner arms being the little T-Rexy arms and their, the big outer arms, they were holding ski poles so that their fists were the queen's elbows. It's never a stunt, it's never an effect. You always have to bring life to the character. If you don't, it's just so much rubber and, and wires. Monster Squad, which had a whole bunch of really fun change techniques, cable controlled effects. The werewolf transformation, which unfortunately was shot in a ambulance under street lights passing by. So it was like a very, very slow strobe. I, I wish it had been in the middle of a library in the middle of the day so you could actually see the effects. But there were something like 25 overlapping bladders in under a one foot area. So the pulsing effect that was common in, in Changeo effects at that time was taken to its logical extreme. And I'd also laid everything out in a very musculature form so it just wasn't a boiling skin. You were literally seeing muscles change. And the hands moved, the fingers changed, the fingernails changed length, which was a mechanical effect in the cable. On Predator, there was only two notes from Stan, which I completely defied. I thought I'd be fired. The first one was, as I was blocking out the body, he says, oh no, you gotta make him as 
big as Arnold. Make him just big. And I say, well, this guy's hopping all over the treetops, Stan. He should be athletic and not muscular. He says, no, 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 make him big like Arnold. Make him big. He leaves, and I'm next day I come back. I'm detailing already in the body. I haven't changed the thing. And Stan's like, ah, looks great. And he walks away. But I'm thinking, wow, he's, I'm thinking I was fired. But I just knew this has, it has to be like this. So he didn't fire me, and the second time was the netting. In my original drawing of the Predator, there's all this netting on the body, right? So we were at a point in the build where I was painting the Predator body. And Stan came in and he says, wow, this looks great, I love it. And I said, oh, it looked even better when I put the netting on his body. And Stan's like, what netting? I said, the netting on the drawings, you know, on the, that I did. And he says, no, 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 we don't want to cover up this beautiful paint job, just no netting. He leaves, next day he comes back. I already had the netting halfway glued in permanently, crazy glue. I didn't just put the netting on, I glued it in permanently. You had to tear that thing out and ruin the suit if you wanted to take it off. Because <laughs> it was like, it had to have netting. And I explained to him, this is because he's an intelligent creature. We have to show that he actually, he wears costumes. He has a, he has a consciousness, you know, he, he's, he's an intelligence. He didn't say anything, he just went, uh, okay. Uh, uh, he just leaves. Next day, he comes back with Joel Silver. And he's t showing Joel all the stuff we're doing on Predator. He says, and look at the netting. You see how it, it makes him an, an intelligent creature. You know, he's a thinking warrior and a hunter. And I'm just thinking, that's what makes Stan so brilliant, you know? He knows, he really knows how to play his clients, he really knows how to get people worked up. He gave me the opportunity to have a voice in the form of the Steve Wang paint job, they call it. Uh, before that kind of came out, when you paint a monster, you paint it purple. You used to call it monster soup from the thing. The thing was all this fleshy veins and purples and all this stuff, and it was cool for, you know, for, for what it was doing. But then that, that paint design became so strong that it took over everything. Everybody started, if it's a monster, they painted like the thing. I just thought, well, that made no sense. If you're gonna, why don't you just refer to nature? And I thought, I thought to myself, well, I can think of this. This is totally different. Why isn't anybody doing this? Well, Stan gave me the opportunity to do it because he saw what I saw, that this was something new and different that could work. You know, without him at the time, who, knew, who knows if I would ever have the opportunity to do a project like a predator or something that could have such a huge reach you know, throughout the world. Stan said to us at the beginning of Pumpkinhead, he said, I, I just want to be a director on this. You guys are the creature effects guys. I'm going to, you know, we're going to have our meetings and discussions. I'll give you my parameters and I'll make comments on artwork, but you guys come up with the solutions. And, and, uh, and it was, it, it went very, very smoothly. Working with someone like Tom in the Pumpkinhead suit, Tom absolutely brought it to life. And his body language, the staccato way that he took his steps pausing at the end of each stride before he took the next step and thinking about where he was going, it brought the character to life and it also gave me a moment as a puppeteer for when the snarl should come into play, when the jaw should move. For Jurassic Park, we knew we were building a 38-foot Tyrannosaurus Rex, but we had no idea how we were going to control it. We bought a motion control system that looked like a sound mixing board. Each individual channel was an individual slider and you know, a slider going up and down for the head going up and down kind of makes sense, but then the next slider going up and down for head left right, ooh, that's, that gets a little non-intuitive. And then the third one is for the head rotating, that's, that, that's counterintuitive, you're, you're going to start losing yourself in the puppeteer. And you can pre-program it if you want to, but then you only get one or two performances, and that never works. You want real-time, live, interactive performance. So you can maintain eye line as you know the actors walk around the stage. You, know, you need to change the position of the head. You don't want to strap Sam Neill with you got to walk here because that's where the T Rex is looking. No, he's going to walk over here because that's where his character needs to be, and the T Rex needs to follow him. So Stan was the one that actually originally came up with the idea of bypassing all of the linear input information on that soundboard and building a miniature T Rex that had motion sensing potentiometers in all of the joints, in all of the same configuration as the full-size puppet. And by moving that miniature puppet in real time was the exact one-to-one -one equivalent of your having gigantic hands and reaching out and moving a 12-ton hydraulic structure. And it worked perfectly. Stan was not trying to create scientifically accurate dinosaurs. Stan was trying to fulfill people's expectations of what dinosaurs look like. We forever changed the zeitgeist of dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. When I first went to work for Stan, I had known about Stan's work. You know, I was already a fan of Stan's work. But to be honest with you, I was more of a Rick Baker fan. 
no matter how fantastic they are, nobody's as great as Rick Baker. Rick Baker, to me, is the greatest artist in our industry. The two twin pillars of makeup effects, you know, was, was Stan Winston and, and Rick Baker. But then when I finally went to Stan's studio and then saw this, all this other stuff I've never seen before, I started to realize, wow, this is guy, this is the risk taker. It wasn't like we had to beat him, but it's like, boy, the bar got raised again. So now we gotta, we gotta, we gotta jump that much higher. And I know through the years, people, I've heard people, you know, say things that are uh, unkind or what have you, but I feel those people didn't really know Stan. And I'm not here to tell you Stan had a small ego and that he was like a Buddhist monk because the guy was driven in part by his ego. And he used to say that. He used to say, leave the, your ego by the door. And I remember thinking, but because because our egos can't fit in here with yours. I heard a lot of stories about how he wouldn't give credit and he'll make a joke out of it and tell people, well, you know, I, wanna, I would thank all these people, you know, at the Academy Award speech or something, but uh, I'm gonna take all the credit instead. You know, he'll make a joke out of it. What I learned from him was that you have to have a single voice. If you are going to create artistry, while you want everybody pitching in and everybody being part of the team, one guy has to pilot the ship, and that guy was Stan Winston. In the situation with the Predator, uh, Stan was very generous. Even Monster Squad, we were on set. The first day that we had put the Gill Man together, and none of us knew it was gonna work. It was three months up to the very last day, and once we glued them all in, Tombo drove all in, and the scenes went away. And we knew, at that point, we had done something new, something, a new technology for the business. And Stan was so proud, and the, the compliments that he got that night, holy shit, you know, it was, it was stuff like, I've been in this business 30 years, I've never seen anything like this before, you know, it was that kind of, you know, from, from his peers. And so he was very proud that night, and he was, oh, these two kids made this, you know, he gave us a lot of credit. The guy was a human being with a, 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 a rounded character, you know. This issue of credit um, has come up because I, for the time that I was there, um, I found Stan to be extremely generous. He always mentioned us when I didn't expect it. It's impossible to know what it was like without having been in the middle of it, and there was a handful of us that were right in the middle of it. You know, the, the, you know how the fans are. There's like anything that even hints at like, you know, what? Mm -hmm. He didn't shit marshmallows? <laughs> Screw you, Gillis! I spent 25 years there working on those movies, and those were Stan's movies, but I feel like they're, you know, all of us on that team, we put in our blood, sweat, and tears into those things, or blood and guts, as you say on your show. Stan? Yeah. He didn't. He, he started out selling dictionaries, didn't he? Yeah, <laughs> he was a dictionary salesman. Wow, right it's quite the leap. Uh, he was a bouncer <laughs> at a at a bar, and then he uh, got into the makeup apprenticeship program at Disney. Disney. Mm -hmm. I think there's a renaissance happening now. I think the fans have fed up. A new generation is like watching the thing for the first time and going, "Why don't movies look like that anymore?" Yeah. Uh, my dad tortured me as a young boy. I'm not kidding you. I think my dad knew that movies couldn't scare me, so he would do everything he could to actually dress up and mess with me as a boy. He right. would change himself into a werewolf, and creep into my room at <laughs> two in the morning, and freak me out. And his favorite move, and this was the most horrifying thing, he would make himself up like a ghoul, dead ghoul, and I'd be in my room, eight o'clock, you know, eight years old, getting ready for bed, and his face would come up in the window, and it was Dad. Wow. And But it was still horrifying, and I'd run to another room, and he would pop out, up in that window, and I'd just run through the house. He'd come up in every window. <laughs> I'd run to Mom. Mom, make him stop. I know it's Dad. Make him stop. she go, I can't help you, honey. It's what he does. <laughs> Happy Halloween from Blood and Guts.